was really scared to watch this film, but what can I say? Not all heroes wear bonnets. <laughs> Welcome back to my channel. Now, if you haven't been here before, um, you might not know that. No. <laughs> <coughs> I do say by me, I have been caught in a draft. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to my channel. My name is Lena Norms. And if you haven't been here before, uh, you might not know the world's on fire. Well, the world is on fire, but it's important to occasionally maintain a love of the trivial. Are women's voices trivial? Are you a secret misogynist, Lena? I would recommend when pondering any climate crisis to take a brief period drama break. And that's what Universal Pictures gave me the opportunity to do the other day. They let me see the new adaptation of Emma early. God bless. Send it up. Not spawned by them. I was gifted, obviously, a screening to see the film. Uh, and I was I was jubilated and also incredibly nervous, as I know a lot of Jane Austen fans have been. For those of us still reeling from the funeral of cats, God rest its soul. It's a nervous time to be dipping into um, new adaptations of old loves. My, my true love of all the Jane Austens is Emma. And on top of that, my true film adaptation love is the 1996 Gwyneth Paltrow adaptation. So today I thought I'd fill our lives with fun and frivolity and review the two films. Why do it with nuance? We're literally just gonna pitch them against each other. <coughs> oh, I'm fainting. Frightfully overcome with excitement. If you can continue past this point and honestly have never seen or read Emma before and don't want to be spoiled. I mean, you're a few sandwiches short of a picnic and I can't help you there, mate. Um, this is mainly, I guess this is mainly for fans of Emma, like me, who might be nervous about seeing the film, or people who have already seen the film uh, and want to talk about the nuances and how they feel about it, because I have a lot of feelings. Now, there will be a winner here and a loser. None of your socialist sharing today. I'm serious about this. this is a, there are categories. We're going to do overall look and feel, otherwise known as world building. We're going to do casting. Yes, I'm going to go through every single character. We're going to do most love slash most important scenes. Then finally, we're going to discuss the portrayal of Emma, the character. <laughs> Look, I'm not gonna lie, when I first came in to this film, uh, I didn't really warm to it for the first third of the film. I was expecting it to be uh, more starkly directed and I struggled to immerse myself in the world. There was a little bit of a Brechtian gap between how I was expecting to feel immersed and, and how immersed I actually was. I think that was intentional. It really reminded me of Marie Antoinette. Block colors, weird camera angles, a general staggered awkwardness to the way it was it was cut, which I, I, li I like, it's just not the, I was warned from the trailer that it would be like that, but it was also just such a contrast to the warmth and the, the nostalgia and the gentleness of um, the 1996 version that it first felt weird to be immersed in uh, an environment that was associated with Emma. I'm really attached and um, just a real big advocate for the way the 1996 version opens. It establishes an authorial voice, which I think is the voice of Mrs. Weston in it actually. And they use that narrative voice the whole way through the film, which mimics um, the satirical narrative voice of Jane Austen herself. They have this shot of the globe and it's zooming in to this painted globe uh, that Emma has. And there's this line about when you live in a small town and you lived in this era, this was your world, your t small town was your world and everything in it became incredibly important to you. And I think that was a really self-aware way of saying, look, we know these people are privileged, we know this is frivolous, but to these people it is important. Let yourself care about this small town for this hour and a half, make this town your world. Which for a modern audience I think is really important and I love the way it's set up. You don't get that with the new Emma, but you get a different kind of intimacy. We see the characters in more private moments, moments that aren't in the book or the other film where they're just sitting alone in their houses, um, sometimes naked, getting dressed, assembling themselves, reminding us that naked and alone, these people are very similar to us and it's only when around each other that they are more performative and seem more distant from us. Yes, Johnny Flynn is naked in this film. Please ready yourself, because I was not. But all that being said, as I got into the 2020 version of Emma, I started to really love it and I started to compare it to um, the importance of being earnest film and the kind of whole tone of the importance of being earnest in Oscar Wilde, which is a lot closer really to the way Jane Austen wrote, particularly towards the end of her life when she wrote Emma. It's more satirical than sentimental. This is a comedy of errors. And the sound design as well made things more echoey, more distant, more, um, stark. In the new version we also see more of 
Harriet's dig. Harriet is the girl that Emma befriends and hopes to bring up into society, even though we don't know who Harriet's parents are. And she has just graduated from this school for orphans where she was left by her anonymous parents and still has digs there. That's where she lives. That's where she hangs while her future hangs in the balance. Um, Emma meeting her at this very um, integral stage of her life and also Emma lowering herself to um, entering spaces like that when she's so elevated in society is is not what happens in the books or in the other films but is it an interesting choice um, that a lot of the scenes that are supposed to be set in Emma's house are in fact set in the humble lodgings of Harriet. So overall surprise win of round one I actually think that the 2020 version is better. Not warmer to my heart, not more, something that I feel so emotionally close to, but objectively more close to what I think Jane Austen intended and in what it achieves, much more interesting. Ding, ding, one point. Also, I'm not sure about the Ren symbolism of seeing Harriet's um, other orphans, but there was some weird Handmaid's Tale imagery going on that they had to have been aware of. And I'm not sure what the point of that was, but let me know in the comments below what you think your theory is as to why they would have done that. The casting, let's talk about the casting. Mr. Knightley. Mr. Knightley is, let's be clear, 16 years older than Emma in uh, the book, which is uncomfortable for modern audiences to watch and also um, more unbelievable, like, like harder to warm to, especially when Mr. Knightley has a certain amount of social power over Emma. He's much more friends with her dad than he is her. And there is a lot of like weird daddy issues um, that can be inferred from the book where it's like, she won't leave her father. So she marries a friend of her father and then the father and the father live together and she gets to stay in her family home. That is objectively, by modern standards, really weird. And I think it's good to transpose that a little. So c casting Johnny Flynn, oh, who I, I, I gen, like there is, I, I genuinely love, and I'm not really somebody who gets very attached to public figures, but I think he's amazing. He was in Lovesick, which should have been and was called Scr Scrotal Recall. And for that, I recommend it alone. Um, he was in Beast, which is he was incredible in. Uh, he's also an incredible musician. And I think he was a really interesting choice for this role. Jeremy Northam, while very slick, prevent, presents a very two dimensional um, Mr. Knightley, however hot he is in this film. And I feel like Johnny Flynn brought a soft masculinity to it that is necessary for the role and that I loved. He is a lot younger in this. They look the same age. He has a very um, moral, heartfelt quality to him, but he also brings a more bumbling, fumbling side to him, which I think is really nice. And especially at the end makes a lot more sense, especially when he's stumbling over his words. He actually dares to cry twice in this film, which is obviously off book, but great. We've spoken before about how I love a man who cries. And you really feel for him in this. There's also a really interesting setup of seeing him getting dressed in the morning, him um, being assembled into period clothes, when often it is a trope in period dramas where you always see the woman being buttoned up. Um, but you see him naked. Um, <laughs> don't be a perv, Lena. This, we live in an equal society. Come on. We see him vulnerable and naked. We see him being dressed by butlers and, and, and seeing how uncomfortable period clothes are for men as well and how he is putting on a front of masculinity and strength. Um, and I thought that was a really interesting choice. Overall, I just loved him in this. He brought a real kind of English awkwardness. He made Mr. Knightley funny. I don't know how he did that. He's now my one true Knightley. The other ones can fuck right off. I was disappointed in the casting of Harriet. Let me know what you think. Tony Collette plays her in the 1996 version. And in this is Mia Goth. And Mia Goth really plays on her stupidity, um, uh, which I thought was a shame. In the book and in the 1996 version, it's much more clear that Harriet, uh, while while a bit scatty, uh, while a little bit slow on the uptake, is, is really like Emma's equal in personality. She has as much personality as Emma. Uh, she can match her in conversation. And it's much more clear why Emma would befriend her uh, despite the social class disparity. To, my, to me, it's much more clear in the original narrative that they have an intimate friendship. It's only really at the end of the new film that we see them physically touching, laughing together, um, having any kind of connection. In this new film, Harriet is shown much more as really easy bait. In this one, Harriet is clearly prey for an Emma with claws. She's not somebody Emma sees, appreciate, and however self-centeredly wants to help. I have no opinion on Mr. Elton casting, uh, nor do I want to. I really hate this character. They're quite an easy character to play and both Mr. Elton's do it 
justice. So I don't. I points for all the houses. Everybody gets a point. Let's be Dumbledore at the end of every fucking Harry Potter book, where everybody gets a prize. <laughs> Bill Nye as Mr. Woodhouse. I'm not even going to bother learning the name of the 1996 guy because God damn it, Bill Nye is now my original Mr. Woodhouse. He doesn't get as much screen time in the 2020 film um, as he does in the 1996 one, which is a shame because there's so many funny moments in the book with Mr. Woodhouse and I love him and he really makes the book for me. They did this really clever device thing with being obsessed with giraffes and blinds and stuff in the in the new film and I loved that and I think uh, Bill Nye is, is such a clear and crisp actor that he can get across a very big character in a very small amount of screen time so he was a perfect choice and it's also really funny because he admits in interviews that he's never read a Jane Austen book never watched a Jane Austen film but very much enjoyed wearing the britches which I appreciate I, oh my god we're gonna very briefly talk about this because it's such an easy one okay Mr Martin is played by Adam from sex education and it's so good and need I, I don't need to say anything else. Okay, so they go and give us Juliet Stevenson for Mrs. Elton in the 1996 version. Get your lesbian feet out of my shoes. And then you go and throw Tanya Reynolds into the mix and I'm supposed to choose. If there's ever an Amdram performance of Emma, please cast me as Mrs. Elton. I think I would be incredible at it. This is my life calling. Tanya stands up to this part so well. She has this incredibly long neck that for some reason I now see is perfect uh, for the character of Mrs. Elton. She's much more starkly rude um, than the 1996 version and, and you kind of like, with the 1996 version, I love it because literally everybody knows of Mrs. Elton um, in the 1996 version. Um, but I also just love the way Tanya played it and I think, God, this is a, I, points for everyone. Points, I'm sorry, there are points for everyone here. Frank Churchill, why are you putting this random hot man in this character? Look, we had, we had you and McGregor for Frank Churchill in 1996. It was very hard to top that. But I feel like they went in a completely different direction with the 2020 version and I'm not really sure how I feel about it. In the 1996 version, Frank Churchill, who is a bit of a rake, convinces Emma that he's in love with her when he's fucking not. He's secretly engaged with Jane Fairfax. But we're supposed to warm to him, we're supposed to believe that he is an equal companion of Emma, we're supposed to be excited about them. Um, and Ian McEwan plays a very cheeky, um, amiable Frank Churchill. Whereas, who, who is this guy? Callum Turner? This guy just reeks, like the way he plays it, he just reeks of STIs. He's like the, he's like the fuck boy that you're immediately just like, I will attain some kind of disease or heartbreak from this man. He's so clearly a rake in this that it's hard for us ever to believe that Emma might be with him, um, which is, such a fun part of the plot to be sucked into and you're just not in this film because of the casting and I just I like I'm just like no to this Frank Churchill no no points for you and McGregor a cake for him four for you Glenn Coco I am a somebody's committing a crime again who was it crimes against humanity the police are coming for you people who cast Frank Churchill <laughs> now Miss Bates Miss Bates Okay, I love I love Miranda. I do. I'm such a fan of it. I was so excited to see that she was in it and I think it was really good casting. However, weird choice because the whole comedy and what's so funny about Miss Bates is that she is a comedy duo with Mrs. Bates, who is mute. She doesn't speak and Mrs. Miss Bates translates to her very loudly. And what's so funny about what's written about them is that they always come as a pair. One of them doesn't talk. You get the idea that she kind of disapproves of Miss Bates and Miss Bates won't stop talking and that's what's funny. In this, there is a complete absence of Mrs. Bates. Where is she? She's occasionally there. There's nothing funny about their relationship. And actually I was kind of disappointed because Miranda plays this quite straight. Miranda Hart plays this um, as a serious part and occasionally will add humor. She really just uses her blank face look that she does with everything uh, to insert the humor rather than using pacing and, and intonation and, and more script and I don't know. Oh my God, is Ruth Jones in the 1996? We need to go back. It looks like she plays ba the Bates maid. We're gonna go with Sophie Thompson for this one. She did such a good job and I'm sorry, Miranda, but the stakes are high here, what can I say? Casting round over, we're now on to most loved slash important scenes. What did I see? What did I not see? How did we see that? Let's find out. <laughs> There's a scene I really love in the 1996 version that I didn't, I don't think it's even in the book, but it's definitely not in the 2020 film and I really missed it. And it's Harriet's most precious treasures bag. <laughs> All the things she obsesses over with the men that she's in love with and how she burns them. And it's such a sweet, like summarizes her character, well rounds and 4Ds her character so well that I really missed it as a scene. And I'm sad. Also in the new one, we don't get the crash of Emma going into the lake and then Frank Churchill rescuing her. 
which is weird. Why omit that? It was, there was a weird, that's such a great visual scene. Could you not afford a pond? And they also, they slightly mess with the storyline, maybe to make it more obvious for audiences that haven't seen or read another version of Emma, but also it's such a, an easy thing and, and makes it so much better. In the new one, Harriet realizes that Emma is also in love with Mr. Knightley before it all kicks off. They have a back and forward about it. She's like, hang on, you also like Mr. Knightley. Now in the book, what's magical about that and what in the 1906 film is that Harriet's so innocent that she doesn't realize why it would be bad that she liked Mr. Knightley or why Emma is so upset. And then you can't really wait for it to kick off and you don't know what's gonna happen and it's very exciting. For that to happen so early on and for it to not be what really happens and for that to be so obvious and, and you've got my man, well it's my man, well I love him, no you love him, is so, like it cheapens it I think, it cheapened the story and I don't, I maybe I'm just, maybe I'm just being a stuck in the mud grump but like why would you why would you do that it's so much more interesting when she doesn't know and then emma has to make a decision later as to how to tell her and whether to go for knightley and you know it's the main foil of the book the main moment of oh shit but the biggest change and again more spoiler alerts the biggest change that i loved in the 2020 version was the insertion of a nosebleed at the most pivotal and romantic point of the film where in every other adaptation we have got a kiss and a zoom out on the mountains and you're all so happy for everybody. In the 2020 version, he confesses her love, she goes to kiss him and she gets a massive fuck off nosebleed. And it's so good, it's so funny. And it's absurdist, I like it. It's in the tone of the book. It's what Jane Austen would have wanted, a nosebleed, genius. It makes it more frantic and awkward and it shows how panicked Emma is about hurting somebody else. And it shows how preoccupied she is with what other people think of her and how she makes other people feel, which ultimately I think is more accurate for Emma, that she wouldn't just jump into something and start kissing somebody and being like, it's fine because I'm in love, who cares about everybody else? It's a minor moment of horror that a modern an adaptation of any Jane Austen film requires and I loved it. Maybe in the 2090 version we can have Emma on her period. Just a suggestion. <laughs> and the other big moment that I think was done so much better in the 2020 version was the dance. After Mr Knightley saves Harriet from all the embarrassment and asks her to dance, Emma's so impressed with how thoughtful and caring he is that she effectively asks him to dance. And then they go, well, they, we can because we're not really brother and sister. We're not related. Not brother and sister at all. And it's sexy. And then they go into this dance and in the 1996 version, it's so like, it's just them repetitively holding hands, and then letting go of hands and, and being happy. And it's not really, it's supposed to be the moment they realize they're in love with each other. And it's kind of like not as much in the 1996. And in the 90, and in the 20, I'm so excited. In the 2020 version, it's so hot. It's the hottest dance scene. Oh, I feel a little, can we open a window? <laughs> it's all about like, you need to watch it, but like the way they touch each other and how like unspoken it is and the way they like brush up against each other and like the, the like uh, sound design, you can hear them like touching each other's clothes as they dance. It added a rare moment of sex to a essentially sexless um, film. <laughs> and finally, ding ding, the last round, Emma herself, who will win? <laughs> You might have noticed in the casting round I left Emma out, that's because I have many opinions and it links to how I generally think the character of Emma was portrayed um, in both films and, and why I think the casting was successful or unsuccessful. Um, so we have Gwyneth Paltrow in the blue corner and in the red corner Anna Taylor-Joy, which Miss Woodhouse will win. Well, it all depends on how you feel about Emma as a character, what you want her to be and what Jane Austen wanted her to be. Well, I'll tell you what Jane Austen wanted her to be. Jane Austen said, I am going to make a heroine whom no one but myself will like. At this point in her career, Jane Austen has already knocked out Sense and Sensibility, Pride and Prejudice, and Mansfield Park. She's already a hit, she's already famous. She's getting to that point where she's like, fuck it. I'm gonna write a bitch that nobody likes. And honestly, as a teenager, when people are like, I am just like Elizabeth Bennet, I was like, I think I'm kind of more like Emma. What I love about Emma is she's somebody with a default setting of selfishness that she knows about and is constantly railing against and trying to become better. I felt the casting in the 2020 version was a lot meaner. She played Emma a lot meaner. At the beginning of the film, she was quite two dimensional with the way she played it. There were less exhausted, trying to do the nicest thing faces and more like, huh, 
everybody thinks I like them, but literally I hate everyone, kind of looks. And it's not really what Emma's like in the book. And I, I thought it kind of took away from the beginning of the film. And that's why in the first part of the film, I felt a little deflated and a little worried. However, no, actually not however, let's first go back to why I feel this way. Gwyneth Paltrow in this film plays Emma less satirically. And I'm not saying that's good or bad, but she plays her in a more sentimental way, a way that's really sincere. There's this scene at the beginning where we really see sincerely Emma's love of Mrs. Weston and her leaving being the catalyst for her making friends with Harriet and creating a plot line for this novel in the first place. We see how much she really loves her and cares about her and how she is the center of her world rather than just in the 2020 version, she kind of knocks on her door and is like, I'll miss you, don't leave me, I, w I want, I don't want you to leave me because I need you and I don't want you to get married. And the 1996 version, it's more about how much she really genuinely cares about Mrs. Weston. It's not just the way the actress plays it, it's also the opportunities in the 1996 version uh, that Emma is, is given to show her more compassionate side. In the book and in the 1996 version, Emma acknowledges Mr. Martin, the farmer that Harry is, Harriet is secretly in love with and, and is supposedly below Emma. She still acknowledges him, she still says hi. In the 2020 version, she's really rude. It's really out, out of her station, out of her character to not have any manners and completely ignores him, doesn't look at him, won't talk to him. Um, completely snubs him rather than being polite but also being like <laughs> I think you're quite poor <laughs> than in the 1996 version at least pretending to be interested in what he said and saying hello. In the 1996 version Emma is at ease around poor people she's the person when they go to help people in poverty she's the one who easily tends to the sick gives them food looks after the children and it's Harriet who's supposed to be of a lower class than Emma that looks awkward and doesn't really know what to do and doesn't really want to help the poor people. <laughs> She's humbled much earlier by Harriet's behavior in the 1996 version and says, now I see I should be lucky to resemble you in any way to Harriet. It's quite early on that she's like, I think you might be inherently a better person than me. You may not have as many manners and graces or as much money as me, but I acknowledge early on in our friendship that I think you're just like a purer person than me, which doesn't happen in the 2020 version at all. They very much sensationalize the idea of Harriet being a pet that Emma keeps around rather than Emma being deeply lonely and needing company and finding it in this very pure hearted girl. However, all of that being said, 2020 Emma, there's more of a journey that we go on with her because if she starts off a bitch and becomes definitely not a bitch, it's a more dramatic change for us. It more effectively shows us the difference in her personality and what she's gone through in her character arc. Ultimately, the point of Emma's character is, I think, similar to her other books, but in another way, showing that women need to operate within their class systems, the restrictions of their gender to be happy and succeed. For Emma, she knows that her freedom and the fact that she doesn't need to marry is afforded to her because of her wealth and class. She sees that Harriet doesn't have that. In fact, Harriet has nothing. We don't know who her parents are for most of the book. And that she could descend into poverty and ultimately death. Harriet is half a vanity project for Emma, but also partly to raise her out of a situation that particularly won't benefit Harriet because she is a woman. And getting her married off to somebody with wealth is a way of saving her. She wants to teach her how to hold a fort so she can get her a roof over her head. In the end, it's executed badly and she does her snobbery means that she snubs the one person that Harriet really loves who is a farmer, but very a very middle class genteel farmer who can write and wear top hats and is friends with her love, Mr. Knightley. But in the film, what is interesting is that she doesn't only in the end accept Harriet's match to Mr. Martin and uh, accepts him round to her house. She also accepts what is revealed to be Harriet's dad, who is a tradesman and invites Harriet's dad around to the house, which is, I can't emphasize, much more of a shift than inviting Robert Martin around. And that's something that doesn't happen in the book or the 1996 version, but is an emblem of social progress and something that I think is really cool to insert into the 2020 version. And I liked that. So while I'm not in love with the casting, weirdly, I think I'm gonna get let the 2020 film win this round. And points aside, I'm gonna let the 2020 version win. What I haven't mentioned so far in this video is that Emma, despite being one of the most famous books by a woman ever and to be about a female protagonist has never had an adaptation of it made both screen written and directed by women who are by the way 50 fucking percent of the population the director deficit is deafening. As I mentioned when I talked about Mr. Knightley, I think this film is really shot in the female gaze. We see a lot more of the men, the softness of the men. We also see a lot more of the separation between the men and the women, how Emma is often sidelined when Mr. Knightley and her dad are talking. Generally, I think it's it shot more true to form of how Jane Austen might have intended it. That means I didn't get my warm, sentimental supermodel, Emma, 
I got mean, slightly spoil Emma. It means I got a more distancing, satirical setting and overall look to the film. I get, I got a more brisk and less fluffy adaptation of the novel. And that was down to Autumn Du Wilde, the director, and the screenwriter, who was Ellen Catan, who is of Lubin Rees fame and won the Man Booker Prize a while ago. What this film taught me is that I think the world is ready for a meaner Emma, which is a truer Emma, and I believe by Jane Austen standards, a more accurate Emma. So while the beloved 1996 version will always be close to my heart and an OTP, the 2020 version wins. It wins the battle. You can all go home and have a Coke now. And women, women win the war. <laughs> <coughs> Not this woman, this woman is dead. She's. <coughs> <coughs> very much on the way out. Thank you so much for watching. Have you watched Emma yet? What did you think? Tell me in the comments below. I really want to talk about it more. If you haven't been here before, consider subscribing for more videos like this one. Um, if you want to support these videos, you can join the Gumption Club for as little as a dollar per thing and get lots of amazing perks. I have been Lena Norms. You have been whoever you are behind the, the screen. This has been whatever this is. And until next time, frogs nog out.